Hi, I'm Emil Björnsson, and I have worked on near-field communications for five years. In this talk, I will tell you about three common misconceptions in this research area. One can say that near-field communication is a paradigm shift for wireless communications, because it changes how we are transmitting. Traditionally, up until 5G, we are typically using base station with antenna arrays that can send signals towards users that are in the so-called far field. And the beam then looks like a ray of light like this. However, if we would in the future build arrays that are much larger, maybe they are spanning the entire facade of a building, and we can call them extremely large aperture arrays because the aperture, the total length of the array is very large. Well, then we can focus signals in different ways. For example, like a ball of strong signal power around the receiver. And the reason that we are talking about this now is that the distance at which the user needs to be in order to see this kind of near field effects is smaller than two times the array length, so the aperture length squared, divided by the wavelength. So as we make the arrays bigger and we shrink the wavelength, this so-called Fraunhofer or Rayleigh distance becomes longer and longer, and most users will be at shorter distances. The fact that signal beams look differently in the far field and in the near field have important implications for spatial multiplexing. Traditionally, with the 5G array, well, we are serving multiple users that are in the far field, so beyond the Fraunhofer distance. And then we create these beams that start around at that distance, and then they are continuing all the way towards infinity. And then we can serve users in different angles at the same time, at the same frequency, and get higher data rates. But when we make the arrays bigger, well, the Fraunhofer distance moves further away. We can still serve users in the new far field, but we can also serve users at shorter distances. And they might even be in the same angle, but at different distances, because the beams can have a finite depth. And if you're really close, the beam width becomes so narrow that it can even send multiple signals to the same user device. So with larger antenna arrays, we get narrow beams, we get finite depth of the beams in the radiative near field. The underlying physical phenomena is the sphericalness of the waves that we are transmitting. And this is what I'm illustrating here. We have a transmitter, it sends out the wave that is propagating in this direction here. And you can see how the curvature of the wave becomes more and more flat the further away we are. And it also spreads out more and more. So this is just a few wavelengths away. But if you move much further away, well, then we can barely see the curvature anymore. And this is when we say that we are in the far field. It's just an approximately planar wave. So both the size of the transmitter and the size of the receiver determines whether we can say that the wave is approximately planar or not. Let us consider the uplink reception of a wave like this. So we have a data signal modulated on a complex exponential and we have the wavelength lambda here and x is the distance. So we're sending a signal from this point here and in any x dimension we can see how we have the sinusoid here. The distance between two peaks is one lambda, so the spatial frequency is one over lambda. If the transmitting user is four wavelengths away from this big array here, which is four by four lambda big, well, you can see here how the wave is changing between 1 and minus 1 and then back again. So we can see this curvature that the wave is having when it's impinged on this big array. If we consider another user located far away with a 30 degree angle with the azimuth dimension here, then we can see another color scheme here between 1 and minus 1, 1 and minus 1 and so on. This is the other variations over the antenna array. And this is characterizing the different channels that we will see at our receiver. If we have a more complicated channel, we can have a more complicated pattern. In this case, we have a user in the far field with four different propagation paths. So regardless of what kind of channel we have, we will see a variation of the wave over the receiver. And the channel that we will have to the user is characterized by this. 
So the spatial frequency variations horizontally and vertically characterize the channel and also where the antenna locations are. Because here I have this lambda over two spaced black dots represent the antennas and it samples this waveform. And this is what determines the channel vector. So let us now have a look at some misconceptions. The first misconception is that the near field offers new channel dimensions that we couldn't use in the far field. So the channel vector, when we have n antennas, is an n-dimensional vector. And among all of the n-dimensional vectors, there is actually only a particular subset of them that are physically possible to be channels. And dimension of this is known as a degrees of freedom. And it can be smaller than n. And from the sampling theorem, we can figure out how large the degrees of freedom can be for an array of a particular size. Here it is L by H. And the sampling theorem says that if we put out antennas with half a wavelength apart, lambda over two, then we take the length, we divide with that, that is the number of horizontal degrees of freedom that we can resolve, the number of spatial frequencies that are identifiable. Vertically, we have the same thing. We take the height, we divide with lambda over 2, and that is the number of vertical degrees of freedom. And the channel now is produced in both horizontal and vertical variations. And if you multiply these two things together, we get the number that could have been the total number of degrees of freedom that this channel can be spanning. But it actually turns out that the variations horizontally and vertically that a radio wave can create over a surface is not independent of each other. So 4 here is actually lower to pi. But we take pi, we multiply with the area L times H, we divide with the wavelength squared, and that is the total number of degrees of freedom that we can resolve in terms of different channels in an antenna array like this. So the reality is that there is no notion of near field or far field here different kinds of channels will create different patterns over the receiver, being spherical or not. And each channel vector is then just describing such a combination. Near field or far field doesn't matter. The important thing is that we put our antennas lambda or two apart so we can sample in such a way that we can utilize all of these degrees of freedom. Then we can still sometimes communicate more effectively in the near field than in the far field. So here is an example from a paper where we keep dropping users randomly in front of a big antenna array with 5,000 antennas. And I'm showing you a blue curve here when we increase the number of users, what is the sum spectral efficiency that we can deliver to those users and it goes up. And this is when we are using both near and far field properties of the channels. While if we are approximating all the channels as far field channels, we can't get as high performance because the users doesn't happen to randomly be located at such places so we get high data rates. But every time we serve a user in the far field, we take away some degrees of freedom that can't be used in the near field and the other way around. It's the same total amount. The second misconception is that near field focusing is more power efficient than in the far field. So let me break down this for you. We have n antennas at the base station here. We have a user device. And from antenna n, we have a certain propagation loss, beta n, between 0 and 1. If we're transmitting with a particular power p, and we are doing beam forming slash beam focusing, then the received power is the transmit power multiplied with the sum of the beta values. And we can rewrite that expression as I'm showing here to extract n, the array gain, which is proportion to a number of antennas, multiplied with the average propagation loss among all the different antennas. And this formula is the same in the near, in the far field. So that means that at the center of our beam focusing or beam forming, we always get an array gain, which is proportional to n. Well, actually not always, because if we are really close, so here is the Fraunhofer distance, and here I'm considering different propagation distances, and what fraction of n we are getting. If we are at really short distances, we can actually get a lower beam form again at the center than you would be getting in the far field. And that has to do with the spherical curvature. When your propagation distance is shorter than two times the array length, well, then you have substantial 
propagation distance variations over your array. So that some of the beta here is substantially smaller than the propagation loss to the antennas in the middle of the antenna array. But in reality, we have the same array gain in the near field and far field. And if something is different, the near field is actually worse. The third and final misconception is that the near field requires new estimation and beamforming algorithms. So we have developed a lot of nice algorithms for estimation and beamforming in 5G already. One category is the codebook or beam training approaches, where we let the base station send around signals in different beams and then the user device reports back which beam is prefers. And these algorithms are model-based. We need to have a model of the propagation channel, we need to know what the array looks like so that we can form beams in the directions that we want them to be and span all dimensions. And one problem is that we have a limited resolution because we're only sending a limited number of beams. We need a lot of signaling because if we have n antennas, we need to send n pilot signals in n different dimensions. And if we are following this approach, well, then we need to develop near field codebooks. So we're not only sending far field beams, but also focus at different near field locations. However, in fact, we can also take a reciprocity based approach to channel estimation. Then we let the user device send the pilot and we estimate the channel on all the antennas at the base station at the same time. This is model agnostic because we just estimate whatever channel we're having. And it's very efficient in TDD spectrum because then we can use one pilot signal, estimate the channel using arbitrarily many base station antennas. And there is no need to redesign this if we're operating in the near field because we never use any models. We just estimate whatever channel coefficients that we are getting. So the reality is that 5D reciprocity based algorithms are sufficient to use also in the near field. We just send uplink pilots known as SRS. We can do then regularized zero forcing, whatever methods that we want to compute the best possible beamforming vectors. And this will work very well. In fact, reciprocity based methods have always been better than the codebook and beam training approaches also in 5G. If we really want to use models during the channel estimation, we can do a parametric estimation where we estimate angles and depth as well, but it's not needed. But if we are using models, either in terms of a codebook or a parametric estimator, when we use reciprocity based beamforming, well, then we can get better channel estimates, particularly at lowest in our scenarios but it's not needed to operate near field communication systems. It just provides some potential benefits. So to summarize, we really need more antennas in future generations of wireless technology. And we need them to get higher bit rate through array gains and spatial multiplexing of more users. When we add more antennas, we will see radiative near field propagation conditions. And that requires us to use new channel models However, we don't get any new channel dimensions just because we see near field propagation phenomena. It's the same number. And we don't get any extra array gains. It's still proportional to the number of antennas. And reciprocity based beamforming algorithm still works terrifically in the near field. If you want to understand this topic at depth, I recommend you to read my textbook on multiple antenna communications and particularly these two papers. And finally, a special thanks to my collaborators that has worked with me on this topic and my funding agencies that have enabled this. Thank you very much for watching.